Hello again. This is White Ash Flies with Colin Mahoney. Thanks for tuning in. Today we're presenting episode two of Alexander Pope's translation of Homer's Iliad, completed in 1720. You can find this episode and older episodes of White Ash Flies on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Anchor FM, and on Twitter at Colin Mahoney15. And now, episode two of Pope's Iliad on White Ash Flies. Achilles with Patroclus took his way, where near his tents his hollow vessels lay. Meantime, Atrides launched with numerous oars a well rigged ship for Chrysa's sacred shores. High on the deck was fair Chryseis placed, and sage Ulysses with the conduct graced. Safe in her sides the hecatomb they stowed, then, swiftly sailing, cut the liquid road. The host to expiate next the king prepares, with pure lustrations and with solemn prayers. Washed by the briny wave, the pious train are cleansed, and cast the ablutions in the main. Along the shores whole hecatombs were laid, and bulls and goats to Phoebus' altars paid. The sable fumes and curling spires arise, and waft their grateful odors to the skies. The army thus in sacred rites engaged, Atrides still with deep resentment raged. To wait his will, two sacred heralds stood, Talthybius and Eurybides the good. Haste to the fierce Achilles' tent, he cries, Thence bear Briseis as our royal prize. Submit he must, or if they will not part, Ourself in arms shall tear her from his heart. The unwilling heralds act their lord's command, Pensive they walk along the barren sands. Arrived, the hero in his tent they find, with gloomy aspect on his arm reclined. At awful distance long they silent stand, loath to advance and speak their hard command. Decent confusion. This the godlike man perceived, and thus with accent mild began. With leave and honor enter our abodes, ye sacred ministers of men and gods, I know your message, by constraint you came. Not you, but your imperious lord I blame. Patroclus, haste, the fair Briseis bring. Conduct my captive to the haughty king. But witness, heralds, and proclaim my vow. Witness to gods above and men below. But first and loudest to your prince declare that lawless tyrant whose commands you bear. Unmoved as death Achilles shall remain, though prostrate Greece shall bleed at every vein. The raging chief in frantic passion lost, blind to himself and useless to his host, unskilled to judge the future by the past, in blood and slaughter shall repent at last. Patroclus now the unwilling beauty brought, She in soft sorrows and in pensive thought passed silent, as the heralds held her hand, and oft looked back, slow moving o'er the strand. Not so his loss the fierce Achilles bore, but sad, retiring to the sounding shore, o'er the wild margin of the deep he hung, that kindred deep from whence his mother sprung. There, bathed in tears of anger and disdain, Thus loud lamented to the stormy main. O parent goddess, since in early bloom Thy son must fall by too severe a doom, Sure to so short a race of glory born, Great Jove and justice should this span adorn. Honor and fame at least the thunderer owed. And ill he pays the promise of a god, If yon proud monarch thus thy son defies, Obscures my glories, and resumes my prize. Far from the deep recesses of the main, where aged ocean holds his watery reign, the goddess mother heard. The waves divide, and like a mist she rose above the tide, beheld him mourning on the naked shores, 
and thus the sorrows of his soul explores. Why grieves my son? Thy anguish let me share. Reveal the cause and trust a parent's care. He, deeply sighing, said, To tell my woe is but to mention what too well you know. From Thebe, sacred to Apollo's name, Etion's realm, our conquering army came, with treasure loaded in triumphant spoils, whose just division crowned the soldiers' toils. But bright Chryseis, heavenly prize, was led by votes selected to the general's bed. The priest of Phoebus sought by gifts to gain his beauteous daughter from the victor's chain. The fleet he reached, and, lowly bending down, held forth the scepter and the laurel crown, entreating all, but chief implored for grace the brother kings of Atreus' royal race. The generous Greeks their joint consent declare, the priest to reverence, and release the fair. Not so Atrides, he with wanted pride the sire insulted, and his gifts denied. The insulted sire, his god's peculiar care, to Phoebus prayed, and Phoebus heard the prayer. A dreadful plague ensues, the avenging darts incessant fly, and pierce the Grecian hearts. A prophet then, inspired by heaven, arose, and points the crime, and thence derives the woes. Myself the first the assembled chiefs inclined to avert the vengeance of the power divine. Then, rising in his wrath, the monarch stormed. Incensed he threatened, and his threats performed. The fair Chryseis to her sire was sent, with offered gifts to make the god relent. But now he seized Briseis' heavenly charms, and of my valor's prize defrauds my arms, defrauds the votes of all the Grecian train, and service, faith, and justice plead in vain. But goddess, thou thy suppliant son attend, to high Olympus' shining court ascend, urge all the ties to former service owed, and sue for vengeance to the thundering god. Oft hast thou triumphed in the glorious boast that thou stoodest forth of all the ethereal host when bold rebellion shook the realms above, the undaunted guard of cloud-compelling Jove. When the bright partner of his awful reign, the warlike maid and monarch of the main, the traitor gods, by mad ambition driven, durst threat with chains the omnipotence of heaven. Then, called by thee, the monster Titan came, whom gods Briarius, men Aegean name, through wandering skies enormous stalked along, not he that shakes the solid earth so strong. With giant pride at Jove's high throne he stands, and brandished round him all his hundred hands. The affrighted gods confessed their awful lord, they dropped the fetters, trembled, and adored. This, goddess, this to his remembrance call, Embrace his knees, at his tribunal fall. Conjure him far to drive the Grecian train, To hurl them headlong to their fleet and main, To heap the shores with copious death, And bring the Greeks to know the curse of such a king. Let Agamemnon lift his haughty head O'er all his wide dominion of the dead, And mourn in blood that ere he durst disgrace The boldest warrior of the Grecian race. Unhappy son, fair Thetis thus replies, While tears celestial trickle from her eyes, Why have I borne thee with a mother's throes, To fates averse and nursed for future woes? So short a space the light of heaven to view, So short a space, and filled with sorrow too. Oh, might a parent's careful wish prevail, Far, far from Ilion should thy vessels sail, and thou, from camps remote, the danger shun which now, alas, too nearly threats my son. Yet, what I can, to move thy suit I'll go to great Olympus crowned with fleecy snow. Meantime, secure within thy ships, from far behold the field, not mingle in the war. The sire of gods and all the ethereal train, on the warm limits of the farthest main, now mix with mortals, 
nor disdain to grace the feasts of Ethiopia's blameless race. Twelve days the powers indulge the genial rite, returning with the twelfth revolving light. Then will I mount the brazen dome, and move the high tribunal of immortal Jove. The goddess spoke. The rolling waves unclose. Then down the steep she plunged from whence she rose, and left him sorrowing on the lonely coast, in wild resentment for the fair he lost. In Chrysa's port now sage Ulysses rode, beneath the deck the destined victim stowed. The sails they furled, they lashed the mast aside, and dropped their anchors, and the pinnace tied. Next on the shore their hecatomb they land, Chryseis last descending on the strand. Her, thus returning from the furrowed main, Ulysses led to Phoebus' sacred fane, where, at his solemn altar, as the maid he gave to Chryses, thus the hero said, Hail, reverend priest! To Phoebus' awful dome a suppliant I from Atrides come. Unransomed, here receive the spotless fair. Accept the hecatomb the Greeks prepare, and may the god who scatters darts around, atoned by sacrifice, desist to wound. At this, the sire embraced the maid again, so sadly lost, so lately sought in vain. Then near the altar of the darting king, disposed in rank their hecatomb they bring. With water purify their hands, and take the sacred offering of the salted cake. While thus with arms devoutly raised in air, and solemn voice, the priest directs his prayer. God of the silver bow, thy ear incline, whose power encircles Scylla the divine, whose sacred eye thy Tenedo surveys, and gilds fair Chrysa with distinguished rays. If, fired to vengeance at thy priest's request, thy direful darts inflict the raging pest, once more attend, avert the wasteful woe, and smile propitious, and unbend thy bow. So Chryses prayed, Apollo heard his prayer, and now the Greeks their hecatomb prepare. Between their horns the salted barley threw, and, with their heads to heaven, the victims slew. The limbs they sever from the enclosing hide, the thighs, selected to the gods, divide. On these, in double calls involved with art, the choicest morsels lay from every part. The priest himself before his altar stands, and burns the offering with his holy hands, pours the black wine, and sees the flames aspire. The youth with instruments surround the fire, the thighs thus sacrificed, and entrails dressed. The assistants part, transfix, and roast the rest. Then spread the tables, the repast prepare. Each takes his seat, and each receives his share. When now the rage of hunger was repressed, with pure libations they conclude the feast. The youths with wine the copious goblets crowned, and, pleased, dispense the flowing bowls around. With hymns divine the joyous banquet ends, the paeans lengthen till the sun descends, the Greeks restored, the grateful notes prolong, Apollo listens and approves the song. T'was night, the chiefs beside their vessel lie, till rosy morn had purpled o'er the sky. Then launch and hoist the mast. Indulgent gales, supplied by Phoebus, fill the swelling sails. The milk-white canvas bellying as they blow. The parted ocean foams and roars below. Above the bounding billows swift they flew, till now the Grecian camp appeared in view. Far on the beach they haul their bark to land. The crooked keel divides the yellow sand. Then part where stretched along the winding bay, the ships and tents in mingled prospect lay. But raging still, amidst his navy sat the stern Achilles, steadfast in his hate, nor mixed in combat, nor in council joined, but wasting cares lay heavy on his mind. 
In his black thoughts revenge and slaughter roll, and scenes of blood rise dreadful to his soul. Twelve days were past, and now the dawning light the gods had summoned to the Olympian height. Jove, first ascending from the watery bowers, leads the long order of ethereal powers. When, like the morning mist in early day, rose from the flood the daughter of the sea, and to the seats divine her flight addressed, there, far apart and high above the rest, the thunderer sat, where old Olympus shrouds his hundred heads in heaven and props the clouds. Suppliant the goddess stood, one hand she placed beneath his beard, and one his knees embraced. If e'er, O father of the gods, she said, my words could please thee, or my actions aid, some marks of honor on my son bestow, and pay in glory what in life you owe. Fame is at least by heavenly promise due to life so short, and now dishonored too. Avenge this wrong, O ever just and wise, let Greece be humbled, and the Trojans rise, till the proud king and all the Achaean race shall heap with honors him they now disgrace. Thus Thetis spoke. But Jove in silence held the sacred counsels of his breast concealed. Not so repulsed, the goddess closer pressed, still grasped his knees and urged the dear request. O sire of gods and men, thy suppliant here, Refuse or grant, for what has Jove to fear? Or, O oh, declare, of all the powers above, Is wretched Thetis least the care of Jove? She said, and sighing, thus the god replies, Who rolls the thunder o'er the vaulted skies. What hast thou asked? Ah, why should Jove engage in foreign contests and domestic rage? the gods' complaints and Juno's fierce alarms, while I, too partial, aid the Trojan arms. Go, lest the haughty partner of my sway with jealous eyes thy close access survey. But part in peace, secure thy prayer is sped. Witness the sacred honors of our head, the nod that ratifies the will divine, the faithful, fixed, irrevocable sign, this seals thy suit, and this fulfills thy vows. He spoke, and awful bends his sable brows, shakes his ambrosial curls, and gives the nod, the stamp of fate and sanction of the god. High heaven with trembling the dread signal took, and all Olympus to the center shook. Swift to the seas profound the goddess flies, Jove to his starry mansions in the skies, the shining synod of the immortals wait the coming god, and from their thrones of state arising silent, wrapped in holy fear, before the majesty of heaven appear. Trembling they stand, while Jove assumes the throne, all but the god's imperious queen alone. Late had she viewed the silver-footed dame, and all her passions kindled into flame. Say, artful manager of heaven, she cries, who now partakes the secrets of the skies? Thy Juno knows not the decrees of fate, in vain the partner of imperial state. What favorite goddess, then, those cares divides, which Jove in prudence from his consort hides? To this the thunderer. Seek not thou to find the sacred counsels of almighty mind. Involved in darkness likes the great decree nor can the depths of fate be pierced by thee. What fits thy knowledge, thou the first shalt know, the first of gods above and men below. But thou nor they shall search the thoughts that roll deep in the close recesses of my soul. Full on the sire the goddess of the skies rolled the large orbs of her majestic eyes, and thus returned. Austere Saturnius, say, from whence this wrath, or who controls thy sway? Thy boundless will for me remains in force, and all thy counsels take the destined course. But tis for Greece, I fear, for late was seen in close consult the silver-footed queen. Jove to his Thetis nothing could deny, 
nor was the signal vain that shook the sky. What fatal favor has the goddess won to grace her fierce, inexorable son? Perhaps in Grecian blood to drench the plain and glut his vengeance with my people slain. Then thus the god, O restless fate of pride, that strives to learn what heaven resolves to hide. Vain is the search, presumptuous and abhorred, anxious to thee and odious to thy Lord. Let this suffice, the immutable decree no force can shake, what is, that ought to be. Goddess, submit, nor dare our will withstand, but dread the power of this avenging hand, The united strength of all the gods above in vain resists the omnipotence of Jove. The thunderer spoke, nor durst the queen reply. A reverent horror silenced all the sky. The feast disturbed, with sorrow Vulcan saw his mother menaced, and the gods in awe. Peace at his heart, and pleasure his design, thus interposed the architect divine. The wretched quarrels of the mortal state are far unworthy, gods, of your debate. Let men their days in senseless strife employ, we in eternal peace and constant joy. Thou, goddess mother, with our sire comply, nor break the sacred union of the sky. Lest, roused to rage, he shake the blessed abodes, launch the red lightning, and dethrone the gods. If you submit, the thunderer stands appeased. The gracious power is willing to be pleased. Thus Vulcan spoke, and rising with a bound, the double bowl with sparkling nectar crowned, which held to Juno in a cheerful way. Goddess, he cried, be patient and obey. Dear as you are, if Jove his arm extend, I can but grieve, unable to defend. What god so daring in your aid to move, or lift his hand against the force of Jove? Once in your cause I felt his matchless might, hurled headlong down from the ethereal height, tossed all the day in rapid circles round, nor till the sun descended touched the ground. Breathless I fell, in giddy motion lost. The Scythians raised me on the Lemnian coast. He said, and to her hands the goblet heaved, which, with a smile, the white-armed queen received. Then to the rest he filled, and in his turn each to his lips applied the nectared urn. Vulcan with awkward grace his office plies, and unextinguished laughter shakes the skies. Thus the blessed gods the genial day prolong, in feasts ambrosial and celestial song. Apollo tuned the lyre, The muses round with voice alternate aid the silver sound. Meantime the radiant sun to mortal sight descending swift rolled down the rapid light. Then to their starry domes the gods depart, the shining monuments of Vulcan's art. Jove on his couch reclined his awful head, and Juno slumbered on the golden bed.